Hello, this is Mr Westwater here and I'm about to go through the summer paper for year 9 sets with a B in front of their um, initials or as their first initial. So, let's get straight into it. So question 1, we're being asked to expand some brackets. Um, so we need to make sure everything inside the brackets is being times by the number outside, like this. So first let's do 4 times 2x, 4 times 2 is 8, we still have that x there and 4 times minus 3 will be minus 12. Okay, so that's going to be my answer. The next one, um, again we need to do 2p, whoops, 2p times 3q, so 2 times 3 is uh, 6, and p times q we would write as pq. And then 2p times p squared, well it's 2 times 1 there, so that's just plus 2, and then p times p squared is p cubed. Okay, so that would be my answer there, one mark for each of those. Okay, next one, expand and simplify. So we need to do each term in isolation, 5 times 3p is going to be 15p, 5 times plus 2 is plus 10. Now the key thing that most people will miss out here is that this is a minus 2 in front of this other bracket. So minus 2 times 5p is going to be minus 10p, but then minus 2 times minus 3 is plus 6. So we're going to have plus 6 there. And if I group all of my terms together, 15p, whoops, uh, 15p, and 10 minus 10p is going to give me just 5p and 10 add 6 will be plus 16. Okay, so you get um, a mark for correctly expanding that out, so this line here, and a mark for your final simplified answer. Okay, and final one, expand and simplify. We have double brackets now, so we need to make sure everything in our first bracket is being multiplied by everything in our second bracket. So let's start with just this x term. So again, I'm going to draw my lines. x times 3x is 3x squared, and x times plus 5 is plus 5x. And now I'm going to move on to this other term in the first bracket, this 2. So 2 times 3x is plus 6x, and 2 times 5 is plus 10. Now the only terms I can collect here are the plus 5x and the plus 6x. So they're going to make plus 11x, and we'll have a final answer of 3x squared plus 11x plus 10. So again, one mark for correctly expanding it, and your, your accuracy mark at the end for collecting terms. Now we have a right angle triangle, which can mean one of two things here. We're either going to be using Pythagoras, or we're going to be using trigonometry. But as uh, trigonometry wasn't in this test, um, well, it looks to me like we're going to be using Pythagoras, especially as there are no angles involved. So work out the length of AC. Now AC is this length, okay? It's the length from A to C. Um, and we're giving our answer correct to 2dp, so I'm just going to underline that so I don't forget it. So my formula for Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or if you like, h squared, to remember that the, the, the term on its own is your hypotenuse. And if we remember correctly, the hypotenuse is the side, the longest side. And it's always opposite our right angle. Okay, and that's the side we want to work out, this AC. So we're trying to work out our hypotenuse. And it doesn't really matter because when we add two numbers, it doesn't matter which order they're in. It doesn't matter which of these we call 7 and which of these we call 8. So let's, for argument's sake, say that A is 7, so this will be 7 squared, and B is 8, so this will be 8 squared. This is going to equal my hypotenuse squared. I can work out each of these, so this is 49, add 64, it's going to be h squared, and if I add them together, 
that's going to be 113 equals h squared. So now I need to square root this answer. Okay. So the square root of 113 is 10.6. Three, zero, one, four. I mean, it does carry on going, but we want our answer to two decimal places. So this is going to be 10.63, because after that second decimal, we have a number that is zero to four. So it stays as a three. And let's just show that we've rounded by putting in brackets two dp afterwards, okay? Let's have a look at the next one. So indices. Now we have two things which are to the same base, so it's the same number being powered um, and they're being times together. Now if we remember this means that we add our powers together, so this will be two, p to the power of 2 plus 7 or p to the power of 9. And in our next question we would do exactly the same for the top, so x to the power of 8 plus 5, when we multiply those things, over x to the power of 3, which will become x to the power of 13 over x cubed. Okay. Now, when we divide powers, we end up subtracting them. Okay. So this will be x to the power of 13 minus 3, or just x to the power of 10. Okay, so a lot of working there. You didn't need all of that working. I, have, I would have thought you could have get, gotten away with that line and then just that line. I'm just trying to show the steps there. If you're not sure why it works, do have a look up uh, in your notes. And here we have um, 5y cubed squared. Now, remember, this means 5y cubed times itself, so times 5y cubed. So this will result in 5 times 5, 25, and y cubed times y cubed. And remember, we add the powers um, when we are timesing them. So this will be 25y to the power of 6. The other way of doing this question, if you wanted to, is to use the power rule, which means that we multiply these powers together. So this would be y to the power of 3 times 2 which as we see gave us y to the power of 6 and we would have 5 squared because it would be 5 to the power of 1 here isn't it times 2 so 5 squared is 25 okay either way you get the answer 25y to the power of 6 okay question 4 find the size of angle e now angle e is on a parallel line which is parallel to this line. And the line that cuts it is the same line as this uh, intersection over here. And we have this sort of Z shape going on, which means that these two angles will be the same, but I should state the rule that I'm using. I can't just write Z angles. I won't get any marks for that. So I should write E is 50 degrees. And then my reason that these are alternate angles. So I will say alternate angles are the same or are equal. Let's, show, let's say they are equal. That's a better word. It's a more mathsy word. Okay. And then find the side of angle F. Angle F is over here. So this intersection corresponds this is my uh, line that passes through both parallel lines. So it's going to correspond to this intersection up here. So I need to do a little bit of work. Um, now, with these sorts of questions, you will get credit for um, labeling your diagram. So firstly, I'm going to, I need to work out one of these angles around here. Now we do have a triangle. So I, if I can work out this angle, then I should be able to work out this final angle in the triangle. So let's work out this one. Now this will also be 50 degrees. And I'm just going to put a reason there because vertically 
opposite angles are equal. So these two are equal. And then this will mean, um, ooh, whoops, um, we have a triangle. So 180 minus 25 minus 50 is 105. Okay, it's 180 minus 75. So this is going to be 105. And the reason for this is angles in a triangle sum to 180. Okay. Now, so that's my sort of reason for this one. Um, now, this angle here corresponds to this angle over here. So my last thing I want to do before I use one of my uh, parallel line rules is to say that this is also 105 degrees and again I'll use vertically opposite angles are equal And finally, I can therefore say F must equal 105 because um, corresponding angles are equal. Okay. You should, at all times, whenever you do these questions, give the rules as you're going along. Okay. So... I'm just going to sort of show what order I'm doing these things in. You could try and label this diagram a little bit better with maybe E, F, G and H or something like that, but that might get confusing. Um, normally they will be fully labelled and so you can refer to each of these um, angles um, in your working. So I'm just going to say working on diagram in a numerical order so hopefully um, someone can follow that working okay um, and I will say so F is um, 105 degrees okay okay question five show clearly that 11 twelfths minus 13 twelfths is 7 over 36. So to be able to subtract fractions, we need them to have a common denominator. Now, I know you can use your calculator to do this, but this is a show that question. So we can't just type this in on our question. We have to show how we would do it without a calculator. Um, and here is our answer. This is what we're trying to get to. So we can't use this along the way. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pretend I haven't seen it at all. And I'm just going to work out this. So to be able to subtract fractions, we need them to have the same denominator. Now I can sort of use this. I know that my common denominator is going to be 36 here. So I'm going to make 11 out of 12 out of 36. So what's happened to the 12 there? Well, it's been times by 3. So the 11 must also be times by 3. Okay, so we have 33 over 36 minus, now if the 18 becomes a 36, it's been times by 2. Okay, so this means that this 13 must be times by 2, which is 26. And if we subdue that subtraction, this is going to equal something over 36. Well, what is it going to equal? It's going to equal 7. Yeah, 33 minus 26. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of work there, but we did really need this line um, as to show our working and then we needed to show that it equaled what we wanted it to equal okay the way we go about these show that questions is going to be really important going forwards okay next question solve 
7x plus 18 equals 74. So I need to think, what's going on with x? Well, I'm timesing it by 7, and then I'm adding 18. So in order to solve this, I need to deal with the thing that is least associated with x first. So that's this plus 18. So my first step, so I'm going to subtract 18 from both sides. Okay, and this will just leave us with 7x on the left and 74 minus 18. You can use your calculator if you're not sure. This equals 56. And now I can divide both sides by that 7. So x equals 8. Okay, it's always important to check this afterwards. So if you want, you can type in on your calculator. 7 times 8 plus 18, and it should give you this answer of 74. Okay, and uh, next question. So we have, um, well, here we go. So yes, yeah, we have uh, 7x plus 8, no, that was the last one. We have 8, we have 5x minus 7 equals 8 plus 2x. So whenever we have something like this, this is slightly different to the previous one because we've got x on both sides. So I always ask, which has the most amount of x? Which has the highest number of x? And if you've got a negative number, you've got to bear that in mind as well. But these are both positive for now. So 5 is the larger out of 5x and 2x. So I'm going to try and group the x's on this side. So my first step is to take away 2x from both sides. And that will mean the 5x becomes 3x, oh, whoops, 3x on the left. I'd still have that minus 7. And on the right hand side, we'd just be left with 8 now. Okay. So now it looks very similar to that previous question we've answered. Um, so I will deal with this minus 7 before I deal with this 3. So I'm going to add 7 to both sides. And this will become just a 3x on the left. And 8 add 7 is 15. And so finally, my last step, divide both sides by 3. So x equals 5. And again, let's just check this works. So 5 times 5 is 25. So this is 25 minus 7. Okay, now that's going to equal 18. And 8 add 2 times 5 is 10. And we can see that that does also equal 18. So I'm quite confident in this answer. Question 7. Find the area of a circle with diameter 12 centimetres. Give your answer to three significant figures. So again, I'm going to underline that degree of accuracy. Now, the area of a circle is given by the formula pi r squared. Okay. So this is the formula I'm going to use. Pi d, or 2 pi r, gives you the circumference, but we're looking for the area. So we need to use this formula. Now, r stands for the radius. And we're not given the radius in the question, but we are given the diameter. Okay. So to get to the radius from the diameter, we just half it. So let's just make a note of this. The radius is going to equal 6. Okay, so give your answer. So the area is going to equal pi times 6 squared. And if I type that in on my calculator, it will say 36 pi. This is the exact answer. But then if we uh, use the S to D button, it comes out as 113.097. 7, 3, 3, I mean, again, it, can, it carries on going forever because we've ended up using pi. Um, but if we're rounding to three significant figures, our first significant figure is 1, then 1 again, and then 3. So this is my cutoff point. So I look at the next number along, which is 0, to decide whether I round the 3 up or down. Now, again, this would mean that I round down. So my final answer is just 113 and again let's give some units here so centimeters 
squared because we're working in centimetres and we're dealing with area. And this has been rounded to 3SF, so I'll give my degree of accuracy with the question as well. Okay. Next question. Find the highest common factor of the numbers 12, 18 and 24. Now, you can use a Venn diagram here, but it might get a little bit messy. Um, let's start thinking about... Um, in fact, I'll use the Venn diagram method and I'll also use the listing method afterwards. Um, so, then in terms of Venn diagrams, 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. 18 is 2 times 3 times 3. And 24 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. So if we thought about this as a... Oh, what's going on there? If we thought about this as... Uh, three circles, which are all overlapping, the highest common factor is going to be where they all intercept in the middle. So it's the things that they have in common. And ooh, whoops. And if we look at this, they all have a two in common. So that would be in the middle. And they also all have a single three in the middle. Okay. Now, if we cross those out, there isn't another thing that they all share. I know that uh, these two both have a 2, but that's not shared in this uh, 18. So my highest common factor is going to equal 2 times 3, which is 6. Maybe an easier way of doing this question is to go through the factors. So 12 has 1, 12, it has 2, 6, it has 3, 4, 18 has 1, 18, we've got 2 and 9, we have 3 and 6, and 4 and 5 don't work with this one. And 24, again we'll have 1 and 24, it will have 2 and 12, we'll have 3 and 8, and 4 and 6. Okay, so again you can see that the highest one that's in each of them is going to be that's six. Okay. Find the lowest common multiple of 12 and 20 and, and 42. So again, if we use our uh, prime factor breaking down skills, um, you, there is a button on your calculator to sort of cheat with this, but um, 12 is two times two times three. And 42 is going to be two times three times seven. Okay. So in a Venn diagram, something like this, we'd have a 2 in the middle, we'd have a 3 in the middle, and we'd be left with a 2 on the left and a 7 on the right if this was 12 and this was 42. So to work out the lowest common multiple, we multiply everything together. So this is going to be 2 times 2 times 3 times 7, okay, which if I type that into my calculator, 2 times 2 times 3 times 7 is 84, okay. And this sort of makes sense as well, because if we think about this, this whole thing here is 42, isn't it? This whole thing. So what are we doing to 42? Well, we're just timesing it by 2, which is 84. So let's just make a note. Let's make our answer very clear. My lowest common multiple is 84. Okay. Question nine. Um, we have a pentagon and we're being asked to work out this angle X, A, B, C for our first question. So the first thing I need to do is work out how many degrees there are in this whole shape. Okay. I've got a right angle and all of these bits and bobs so I can add them all up but I need to know how much there should be in total. Now there is a formula for this, it is n minus 2 times 180. And this comes from however many triangles you can fit in here. So this pentagon has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 sides. So n is going to be 5, so this is 5 minus 2 times 180 or 3 times 180, 
which ends up being 540 degrees interior angles, angle sum. So x is going to equal 540 minus all of these angles. So minus 130, minus 70, minus 125, and don't forget that right angle, minus 90. Okay, so let's just use my calculator to do this. 540 minus 130, minus 70, minus 125, minus 90. And before I press equals, let's just try and anticipate what our answer is going to be. I know it says not drawn accurately, but if it looks like a reflex, or not a reflex, an obtuse angle, we're going to expect something between 90 and 180. And if I press equals now, I have a final answer. Whoops, x equals 125. Okay, and I, I, when I have time to check, I will just check that all adds up. Now, find the, B is find the size of an exterior angle in a regular polygon with 20 sides. So this doesn't actually relate to this diagram, it's a separate question in its own right, but it is still to do with uh, angles in polygons, or this time angles outside polygons. Now if you remember, all exterior angles sum to 360, okay, because by the time you go round a shape, Okay, you'll have made one full turn. So if we have 20 sides, we're going to have 20 angles on the outside. And if they all sum to 360, well, and it's a regular polygon, so these are all the same size, then we can just take 360 and share it between those 20 sides, or divide it by 20. So that's going to be 360 divided by 20, uh, which is 18 degrees. Okay. So, next question. In a sale, a shop reduces all normal prices by 15%. So that's a drop of 15%. This normal price of a CD player is 80 pounds. Work out the sale price of a CD player. So, first off, we need to use our formula, which is um, my starting value times my percentage multiplier multiplier equals my final amount. And in this case, we're trying to work out our final amount. We have our starting. This is 80 pounds. Now, what would our percentage multiplier be? Now, I start off at 100%, and I take away, because it's decreasing by 15%, 15% to end up with 85%, which, as a decimal, would be 0.85. So that's what I'm going to times by. Now, if I use my calculator, this uh, comes out to be, let's just do 80 times 0.85, 68 pounds exactly. So let's make sure I've got my unit in there and uh, I'm happy with that answer. If you wanted to work out 15% first and then subtract it, you could have done, I think 15% would come out as 12 pounds and uh, that way, but this is a much more efficient way and will help you with the more complex uh, questions as well. Okay. Question 11, linear graphs. So, we're being asked to find the gradient of this line first and foremost. Now remember, the gradient is the steepness of the slope. Okay, and it's found by doing the rise over the run, the change in y over the change in x. So let's use these two coordinates that it's given me. So the rise is two units there. We've gone from three y to five y. So that's a rise of two, and along the run is going from two to six. So this is a run of four. Now this is also going upwards, so we know that we're expecting a positive 
gradient. Okay, we should always bear in mind whether we're expecting a positive or a negative gradient as well. So, rise, we said it was two, and the run was four. So, if we simplify this, we can say the gradient is a half or 0.5. Okay. Given the line crosses the y-axis at y equals two, find the equation of the line. Now this is where we use y equals mx plus c. This is our general equation of a straight line. And here, m represents the gradient, and c, if you remember, represents the y-intercept. Okay, and we're told in our question that it crosses the y-axis at y equals plus two. Okay, so our equation is going to be y equals, our gradient was a half, we still need the x in there, and then plus two. So this is going to be my final answer. Okay. Question 12, penultimate question, I think. Yeah. So, uh, show clearly that three and a half divided by five sixths equals four and a fifth. Again, it's a show that question. So we need to sort of block out the answer when we're doing our working, but we can use it to check or guide us along the way. Now, at the moment, I've got some mixed numbers in here. So the first thing I'm going to do is change them into top heavy if they're mixed. So to do that, I multiply three by two and then add the numerator. So three times two is six. Add one is going to be seven over two. So three and a half becomes seven over two. And I'm dividing by five over six. Okay. Now, when I'm dividing fractions, um, we keep the first, uh, we flip the second, and we change the sign, KFC. Okay, so keep the first, so this will stay seven over two, flip the second, so six over five, change the sign, so it now becomes multiply. And when we multiply uh, fractions together, you can cross cancel if you know how to do that. I'll, I'll wait to do that in a second. Um, but seven times six is 42, and two times five is 10. So this will become 42 over 10. Now I notice that these are both even, so I know it can be simplified at least once. If I divide top and bottom by two, this will equal 21 on the top over five. And now 21 is three times seven, so there are no factors going into top and bottom. Okay, now let's just look at where I was trying to get to. Four and a fifth is my final answer. So I just need to make sure that this goes into that mixed number, and it does. Five goes into 24 times, and you have a remainder of one. So this will equal four and one fifth. Okay. If you did want to do something slightly different, that's fine. If you wanted to cross cancel, so seven over two times six over five, you could have done by saying, well, two goes into two and six. So the six will become a three, the two will become a one. And then instead we just do seven times three, which is 21 and one times five, which is five, which sort of gets us to this line as well. Okay, but either way you do it is absolutely fine. And final question. Tim bought a return plane ticket from London to New York. The ticket price was 18, uh, oh sorry, 1,800 pounds. Tim used all his frequent flyer points to get a discount and only had to pay 1,460 pounds. If 1,000 frequent flyer points gets a 20, uh, discount of 20 pounds, how many frequent flyer points did Tim use when he bought his ticket? 
So the first thing we need to do is work out how much money he actually got off. So if we do 1,800 minus 1,460, okay, 1,800 minus 1,460, we can see that he managed to get, he saved 340 pounds, okay? Now, each sort of time you spend 1,000 frequent flyer points, you get 20 pounds off. So let's see how many times 20 goes into 340. So 340 over 20 is 17. So he got 17 discounts. Now, what was our question again? Uh, how many frequent flyer points did he use? Well, for each discount, he needed to spend 1,000 frequent flyer points. So this is 17 times 1,000, which is 17,000 uh, frequent flyer. Oops. Uh, frequent flyer points. It's important with these questions in context that we give our answer in context. Okay, so our answer here would be 17,000. Okay, I hope you found that useful and I hope the birds weren't, weren't too distracting. Um,